Meet Venom, my very first FMA open class car. Hot off the heels of creating Tarantula, my MA open class car, and working on Wolfie, my VS open class car, or one of my VS open class cars, I decided to work on an FMA open class car. And some of the things I wanted to put in it were the same technologies that appear on MS suspension chassis open class cars. For example, not the suspension system. I can't duplicate the suspension system with an FMA, of course, but I wanted to make sure that there was a front AT bumper, right? So I wanted to be able to, to have these little springy things like this. Yeah, that pivot like so. <laughs> I call it a switchblade pivot. And also this should be able to come up this way that way yeah pretty cool and it should be angled at a, at least a five degree angle downward yeah so yeah I got it to do that pretty cool and yeah I ended up I ended up taking inspiration from a design from my friend Ken at Pro Tuners he reversed this 1213 roller on the bottom here um, this is a this is one of those o-ring rollers that I reversed and instead of putting a lightweight 13 millimeter roller because I don't have access to those yet um, I decided to put a regular 13 millimeter roller in the same color scheme as my red and black color scheme right here. So that worked out pretty well. So in the back, there are two 13 millimeter rollers, very long, as you see in the back there. Um, I've got this pivoting system that's what I call the chandelier pivot. Now this is a unique pivoting system. I didn't copy it off of anyone else, but it's got the same kind of range of motion as other pivoting systems out there. And I'll tell you a little bit about how this thing works as we get to it. But yeah, there's a tail damper right here as well. Pretty cool. And yeah, the only thing that's missing is body damper weights. And I don't seem to need them yet anyway. I haven't encountered a course in which I need this just yet. So right now this just flaps up and down for no apparent reason other than it looks cool. So <laughs> pretty darn cool. So most of the weight distribution of an FMA chassis, as many of you know, is towards the front of the car. So because of that, the engine, as you see here, the engine is at the front of the car and that weighs everything down towards the front of the car. So when this goes and jumps off of a jump, or off of a slope that is, this, this has an advantage already by having this extra weight towards the front. This is going to land kind of like that, and that's pretty cool. Now, what happens after the landing, that's up to you, random chance and God. So, <laughs> so, but you can kind of minimize the craziness that happens after a landing by having some weights in the rear to offset that a little bit. So I've got a couple of little weights in the rear here. I've got this tail damper here, and all three act in unison to bring the back of the car down so that it doesn't do this kind of hop, skip, jump kind of thing. So pretty cool. Now, you might say to yourself, you already have a tail damper. Why do you need these two little mini weight dampers right here? Well, the design of my pivoting system is such that if I didn't have these weights here, there might be a tendency for this to rock forward. It might not happen often, but it might. So this is added insurance that that this whole pivoting system stays level, stays, so that these posts here are perpendicular to the track. Pretty cool. So we'll get into some more details about the pivoting system, but as you can see here, we can rotate right and left, clockwise, counterclockwise. We can also tilt up left, up right. We can also tilt forward on both. And there is no, or very, very minutely tiny amount of possibility of negative camber because of the double plate system that I have here, and we'll describe that soon. So pretty darn cool so far. And yeah, once I decide to add to this car later on, it might just be that I add some weights onto here, on, onto this body damper to make it a little bit more stable. Right now, this is 109 grams, pretty darn cool. So now we're going to get into some specifics about this car. Let's take a look at the video. Now I'm going to show you my two pivoting systems. Now, these are not professional pivoting systems, unlike the pro car that I have here for reference. As you see here, this pivots very nicely, left, right, clockwise, counterclockwise, that is. It also pivots upward very nicely. Look at that mushroom cap pivot right there. You can see it, sort of. There you go. Very cool. So yeah, pivots up, does not pivot down. It just locks in place right here so that it does not pivot down. So yeah, and you've got these angular pivots as well. So you can go up on the left, up on the right. Pretty darn cool. And everything seems to be locked in place with the spring mechanism right on the mushroom cap, which uses that little, um, that little guillotine plate that's in that guillotine damper. Pretty cool. So the front has the AT front bumper. 
um, TXN style AT front bumper, pretty cool, but with the Pro Tuners, uh, it's the Pro Tuners version of it. Pretty cool, pretty darn cool. Now, on my pivoting systems, we started off here with Tarantula, and I've got the same kind of left-right pivoting system. It's a little looser though, and you can also pivot upwards. You cannot pivot downwards, so there's no upward angle thrusting, right? So I basically prevented the upward thrust by using these two posts with rubber pipes, and that prevents the tilting upward of this whole pivoting system. And I can also go left, up, right, and yeah, this is kind of like, it was a happy accident that I created this whole thing, because originally what I wanted to do was just have uh, this thing go up and down, not necessarily tilt left and right and tilt this way and that way. In fact, I thought that tilting this way and that way was actually a flaw. So I was trying to find a way to snap it back in place every time. And then I found out that you don't need to do that. Pretty cool. So, so yeah, this is a little more freeform. And I'm pretty sure that if you replace these soft springs with hard springs, you'll get a much stiffer version of this, um, of this pivoting system. Pretty cool. I do not have any sort of AT front bumper on this one. I decided to go just with a stiff bumper. So it's pretty cool, and I've got a tail damper on Tarantula. So here, on Venom, my newest car, we have here another pivoting system, but I call it the chandelier pivot. And the reason why I call it that is because this whole thing basically hangs off of this top plate. So as you see here, I can go left and right here, clockwise, counterclockwise. I can go up on each side, up, down on each side. I could also go up and Basically, it stays pretty much down, except for this one point where I really can go up a smidge. And today we're going to be talking about a way to prevent this from ever going at an upward thrust. And so it's, it's pretty easy. The way I designed this, I could just simply slip in this extra plate right here, and then we can prevent this, this bottom plate from ever going into an upward thrust. So I'm exaggerating the upward thrust here to show you that it can go in an upward thrust. So it doesn't really go in an upward thrust very often, if at all. But we're going to lock it in place so it doesn't ever do so. So in the front here, we've got AT style front bumper, just like the DXN cars. And the difference between this one, I didn't quite know how to rest this on the front plate here. So I came up with my own version and yeah, I got that five degree angle as you see here. Pretty cool. So I'm pretty pleased with my own first version of this. It's a tad loose, right? It's, it's a little loose in the front, but it still works. It still works pretty fine. And I'm going to take a look at this. The front part of here is not loose at all. It's very stiff. It doesn't move at all. So, hmm, I don't know. Maybe I can use stiffer springs and I can prevent it from, from having this little, little bit of torsion twist here. Yeah, so pretty cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I removed the tail damper. There was a tail damper on here. And I'm now going to remove the chandelier pivot so you can all see a little bit more about what I'm talking about. So here, the chandelier pivot has the pivoting part suspended by a post, by a screw, with the lock nut in place and a spring. I could also replace this, this whole thing here, the spring, with a mushroom cap or a spring with an end cap. And if you have a spring end cap on this, then it, all, it only moves clockwise and counterclockwise. I'm so sorry, my dog is playing with the ball in the background. So yeah, so you can either have it just move in a unidirectional way, or you can have it as a free form pivot, like what I have right now with this spring or with the mushroom cap. Pretty cool. So how do we fix the negative camber? So all you need is this plate right here, right? All you need is to position this plate like so. Now, which direction should it be? I picked this curved spot, but I, sh I should have picked a popsicle stick, right? That would have been perfect. But I have this piece as a spare. And I think this will actually be a little superior to just the popsicle stick, and here's why. It's because when I position this like so, I can position this flat up against here and glue it right there, but then it's got this little con concave part right here. And it's not so bad because right here, right here things are resting right like so. If you look at it from the side, it's resting on that plate nicely. However, however, I think it's better if I simply turn this whole thing 180 degrees and then I cover a little more real estate so that this will not have a chance at all of ever giving me negative camber. So, so yeah, if I just keep it like so, if I glued in place like so, then yeah, this, this is like almost perfect. Yeah, so this, this was locked in place and there'd be no negative camber at all. So here I'm trying to push it down a lot and and it's, it's like it's very hard to get, get that negative camber. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to glue this in place just like so with the concave part towards the car itself. And some of you were wondering like does this really fit in the box? And yes it does. It fits barely in the box but it fits. <laughs> so pretty cool. 
So yeah, I've got a sponge break on the bottom. Previously, all of you know that I tested this without a sponge break and it worked fine, but I put the sponge break just for those harsh inclines, harsh jumps, just to slow it down a smidge. Okay, so what I did was I glued the plate along the outer edge right here. I think that was actually better than just lining it up with this inside plate right here. So now we've got maximum depth coverage of this plate right here. So now when we place this, this chandelier pivot back in place, we can see from the side that the very end part of this, of the plate above, like basically touches the rear part of this double plate right here. So now there's no potential for negative camber. Yay! So yeah, it's gonna be very difficult for it to like pull upward from a negative camber. So once we bolt everything back in place, it's going to be strong, sturdy, and everything. So the other, only other thing that I can think of doing is maybe just processing the edges a little bit so that things match properly. And here we go, it's bolted on, as we see here. Yeah, looks pretty good and very little possibility of negative camber. Now there's no, there's no way that this will aim upward because <laughs> there's a plate right there blocking it. Yeah, so plates and screws are the secret to keeping things where they are. Also got a plate right here. Yep, as you see here, it's preventing it from moving forward. Although in a bad crash, this part here did go around the plate, but it had to smash into the wall pretty hard for that to happen. And that happened with 1.62 volt batteries <laughs> on here, and yeah, it was going at really high speed. So yeah, and now we just put this last part in place, which is the tail damper, and then we are done. I put in fresh batteries, 1.48, 1.49 volt batteries in each. So let's see which car will reign supreme. Tarantula was the winner. Yes, by a little bit. Pretty cool. So now we have rechargeable batteries in here. So rechargeable batteries, rechargeable batteries. Let's flip them on and let's see which reigns supreme. of the century not just not just this year not just the decade the century tarantula edged it out yeah but this held in there it's really fast it's got a really fast hyperdash motor i've been priming this hyperdash motor i actually have two hyperdash motors that i use for this venom car and i alternate between the two of them because these two motors for whatever reason they kept on like fizzling out and it turns out that they get dirty really easily so i'm like cleaning them cleaning them after every race or two to revive them basically to make sure that there's no gunk inside and i've just been swapping the motors out between the two hyperdash motors and that's how i've been maintaining like a super consistent speed now truth be told i probably should be doing the same thing on all of my open class cars but for whatever reason, a lot of my open class cars, when they run, they just run. And yeah, my other Hyperdash cars, they don't require such maintenance. So I don't know if it's the motors themselves, they're about to die maybe, I don't know. They're fresh, brand new 2022 Japan Cup circuit motors. So I don't know why they're dying so quickly. Like right out of the box, they were 43 and 44,000 RPM motors. And I said to myself, that's too good to be true because I didn't even have to break them in. Weird, but there's a lot of maintenance involved with those motors. So you give, it's a give and take, right? I could have purchased an older motor, did the break-in process, and slowly but gradually go from 34,000 RPM, which is a more typical Hyperdash motor, to the 44,000 RPM motors that I got in the 2022 series. So yeah, um, potentially this car could be just as fast, if not faster, than this car with the right circumstances. And yeah, you saw it right there. There was a point in which it got off the ramp and it just stopped, slowed down, and then it decided to 
track on again. And it was like really strange because even though it was like basically a head for a way, it just stopped and there's a pause and this had a chance to catch up and go beyond it. And then this ended up catching up with it anyway. Like it's that fast. And it could be just because it's got 109 grams of weight in it versus 122, right? But I don't think that's it exactly. You know, this, this has got an AT bumper design in the front so it can withstand like a lot of the crazy treachery that happens on a lot of these tracks. So this is like prepared for it. Whereas this is a stiffer front and truth be told, the stiffer front could be pretty good around curves and such. Um, however, around digital turns, digital curves, this, this is supposed to be a better option, this AT front bumper. The rear bumper, I stiffened the, the rear tail with a stiffer spring. So I think that made a little bit of difference. Also, I tightened up all the lock nuts made a huge difference. The thing wasn't flipping over like it did before. So yeah, maybe now I can put tape back over on the sponges there. But yeah, this has been pretty good so far. Yeah, I have like a, I'll admit to a design flaw right here. There are two protruding screws right here. And so if I try to put sponge on top of that, it's not just not gonna fly. So I have to replace those two protruding screws with flat screws at some point. Um, so yeah, that's the only big design flaw that I see on my current design on Venom. But it's been working so far. Why does it work? I don't know. It's just pretty cool. And this, this is like, to me, this is magic. And yeah, I want to see how well it does uh, in this weekend's races. So yes, for my very first FMA open class car, I think this was a success. Pretty darn cool. And the fact that it doesn't require body damper weights, that's so awesome. And I think it's just because of the design of the FMA chassis. The FMA chassis, superior design for racing, don't you think? A lot of people use FMA chassis for racing. So, take a look at what I've done here. If I didn't have the sponge here, this would be landing kind of tilted like that. So yeah, because of this motor, this gear cover here, it's pretty high. I had to make something that was equally high on this side as well, so that this body damper would land level. Pretty cool, yeah. Amazing what you can do with a little bit of arts and crafts knowledge, yeah. You've got car catcher material, which is basically polyurethane plastic. You've got sponge material and just a little bit of ingenuity. And yeah, you've got this kind of coolish looking car right here. I think it's cool anyway. And <laughs> in this red and black scheme, yeah. So yeah, this is my first design. Oh, and I also added some eyes to it in the form of flames. So yeah, Venom, that's what I call it. So yeah. First FMA open class car, more to come at a later point. So yes, if you like this video, everybody, please slam the like button, subscribe to my channel, and you'll see more videos just like this one. Until next time, everybody, see you, bye.